joining us for this Pastors Roundtable discussion today. I'm joined, as always, by Reverend Dr. Ken Sherb and by the Reverend Reverend Jonathan Holmes. Very Thanks right. for being here today. And uh, let's get into it. Uh, as sheltering in place started, uh, somebody gave a very good piece of advice and they said this, make sure you don't binge on Netflix, but on the word of God. So why was that such good advice for these times? We know it is. <laughs> we know it's good advice for these times, but at the same time, it's good advice for any time. Right. We want to stay in the word. We want to receive that which gives life, gives forgiveness. Um, we're filming this on Wednesday, but on Pentecost, when this will air, if you will, you know, Pentecost is a good time to point that out because there, Peter, he proclaimed the word. He, he preached it, and it did what God said it would do. It, it, sa- it, you know, it saved people, if you will. Mm-hmm. But on that day, 3,000 people were baptized. And so just that small sermon, if you will, did that much good. Yeah. And if that can do that much good for just the little that it was, I think we can stay in that word and receive it as well. Yeah. Stay alive, if you will. Well, basically, an average, your average Sunday at Trinity, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. That's right. So. <laughs> All an hour of it. You know, can you imagine that? Uh, you, you know, we, we, we look at the, uh, the result of Pentecost and, and uh, what happened, but how did it happen? Word preached. Word That's preached. it. So, uh, so. Speak on that uh, on that subject as far as the the binging and what we ought to be focusing on and digesting. Yeah, well, what's the alternative? If, if you binge on Netflix or, or anything else that you can find available online or something, you may be getting a lot out of it, out of the binging, but what's the binging getting out of you or, or putting into you? What is that kind of binging shaping you to be? Because it will be shaping you. Yeah. Is, is it shaping you to be a person who fears and loves and trusts in God above all things? What is it shaping you to want, to love, yeah. to be? You've got to be aware of that. There's only, really, the Word of God that's going, or it's derivatives like hymns and devotions and so forth, that's going to shape us to be people who are sinners saved by grace. Yeah. That is, that's such a, a big piece for us to to really be prepared for as Christians because and I say this to the catechism class all the time and and in sermons whenever I get the chance that um, one way or another you will get catechized are you going to do it through the lens of God because you know his word and see the world through his word or is it going to be reversed are you going to see his word through the world so that is very crucial that we are so well versed in his word that we can be in the world but not of the world like somebody mentioned one time so <laughs> so let's speak a little bit i think it's it's very important for us to to take the form uh if you will there was an old saying the medium is the message back at one point do you want to speak on that um about the form of of communication that we uh, are using today so frequently now Yeah, particularly electronic communication. Right. And electronic communication that's available to you, you know, in the palm of your hand. Over 30 years ago, before you had that kind of communication available in the palm of your hand, I remember going to a professor at the seminary in Fort Wayne and suggesting a topic that I thought would really be a good one for a missions conference. And so he got out his pen, he had a pencil, or a pen and a pad, and he was ready to take down whatever I said. And I said, my idea is short attention spans. He put his pen down. And as we talked, he said, well, it might be interesting to have like one presentation in a larger conference. I said, no, you need the whole conference. You probably need several conferences on this because this is going to be a real enemy for the church in form. I was already working in radio at the time, (laughs) and I saw what was happening in like the world of radio advertising. I mean, it's no secret that there's the 60-second commercial and then the 30-second commercial, half as long. But advertisers were recognizing that people didn't even hang around mentally for the 30 seconds. So they were thinking about splitting that in half and going to a 15-second commercial as a standard thing. 
And people were even talking about the eventual need to split that in half and go to seven and a half seconds. They had created a monster, and they didn't now know how to live with this monster. How do you give a meaningful message in seven and a half seconds? As I like to say, you can't proclaim the Word of God in sound bites. You might be able to get people's attention with a sound bite, but you can't teach the whole counsel of God in seven and a half second little bits. No. We've got to lengthen people's attention spans. Yeah, exactly. That, you know, you talk about that advertising being uh, indicative of where the people are. I think advertising is always a good litmus test for that. And, and as, as I uh, look at, um, you know, some of, of the periodicals that I have collected over the years, it just blows me away, this very thing in print ads, how long a, an ad from the 70s or 80s even was. They had full trains of thought in there, full concepts and ideas about their product and how different that is from what you see now in periodicals and sound bites. And, and, and like you said, they created a monster that they have to deal with now, and, and, and it is a monster. So what can the church do to lengthen attention spans then, to, to get people to understand this full thread of thinking that goes into the message of salvation. Some of it goes actually back about 500 years. Um, many, many people, what happened then? What happened then? You know, this whole Reformation thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but what was included with that Reformation, though, were the catechisms, like the small catechism. You know, everybody probably watching knows what that is. I kind of called those the original sound bites, if you will, because they're nice and short and they actually teach something. Um, but that's to kind of get us started. But then as time goes on, as we mature, there's the large catechism. Now, the great thing about the large catechism is it's where the rubber meets the road. And he goes through anecdotes. He goes through illustrations. And he gives us real life things. And uh, so that really teaches us to kind of pay attention because... He's doing it in a very systematic way for the benefit of the reader. Yeah, exactly. That, um, I like what you said. It's kind of the original soundbite. And yet, the things of the catechism, and especially the small catechism, as Luther explained them, there's still a thread of an entire thread of thought. It's not just a, a, you know, a soundbite, just do it, or you know, something like that. It's, it's a thread of thinking. So... Um, so speak to that, Dr. Well, sure. The large catechism expands things out. Right. It applies this teaching to life. Occasionally Luther tells stories, makes comparisons, and those can always be good to kind of bring people along and keep their attention. Uh, for example, I told a story a little while ago about uh, the guy with the pad, you know, just to show that sometimes we don't see the things that are important for us to see, that even though they're right in front of us. And I think it behooves those of us who preach and teach, to keep that in mind, to try to show people things in the biblical text that they haven't seen before. And if they get the idea that they're going to see something you know, that's, that's new, at least in some way to them, they'll get it. And, and there's basically two ways to show something new in the text. There's things that are new in meaning, things that are new in significance. Now, the, the meaning of the text does not change. Right. But its significance for me at given times of my life, given situations I'm in, that will change. Here's a story to show meaning and significance. One time I was driving down the road in the car with my wife, and she says to me, out of the blue, who's taking Dramamine? <laughs> who's taking Dramamine? <laughs> It turns out in that same car a couple of days earlier, I had taken a friend to the airport. And before he got on his flight, he took the last dose of Dramamine from a box and he dropped the box on the floor of my car. This all happened with me completely being oblivious. I didn't know he had taken the Dramamine. I didn't know about the box. I didn't even know the box was still in the car when Lana saw it. So when she says to me, who's taking Dramamine? I knew the meaning of every word in that sentence, and I knew what it all meant put together. I had no idea what that had to do with me or with our conversation at that moment. It was a problem not of meaning, but of significance. Well, in the biblical text, the meaning does not change, but that doesn't mean 
that we're all on board with all the meaning all the time. I mean, I'm going through the book of Acts right now, again, in Greek, and I'm constantly seeing things and saying, I didn't realize that that was the Greek word that was used there. Or if I knew it before, Mm -hmm. I, I need to be reminded of it. So in that sense, you may see some new meaning. Not that the meaning has been put there anew. It was there all along, ever since the Holy Spirit inspired it. But now I see that. And pastors can do that. We can point out to people features of the text right. that they may not have known. But even more, like Luther did more so in the large catechism, we can point out the significance. What is the importance of this for you right now in your life? And the message of salvation from sin, death, and the devil is so massively significant that we can spend well, we can spend our entire lives in this world trying to figure out what that significance is for us in any given moment. So when people say, I see so much more meaning in the Bible through the years, what they probably mean is they see more significance. Yeah, good, well said. So l- let me play devil's advocate here, um, if I could, because... What you just said, unpacking the story for uh, people to hear the word of God and be saved, is the job of the church, right? Can I get an amen? Amen. Uh, all right. <laughs> the, uh, is it the job of the church to lengthen attention spans? Is that are we tasked with with that job? I would say yes, kinda. Right. And <laughs> yes, definitely. Right. Two two answers. <laughs> The yes kind of is that the, yeah, the, what Christ told the church to do is preach the gospel and administer the sacraments. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. You do that by baptizing and teaching. Now, as an aid to us doing that teaching, yeah, it is important for us to do everything we can to lengthen people's attention spans and to figure out ways that we're certainly not taking them in the wrong direction. Amen. Yeah, exactly. That... And so, and I like the way you answer that, yes and yes and no and yes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, you know, it, it, in the Great Commission, it isn't necessarily stated there, but it is an underlying fact of getting them to understand the story. That, that story is not a bumper sticker. It is far deeper than that. And, and in fact, the more you delve into the Word of God, the, the deeper you understand it actually is. And, uh, and that s- simplistic story of salvation is way deeper than anything else. So, so the, uh, w- w- what are some of the things that you've done then to help people get into this thread of thinking and this, this thought? Well, as somebody who actually does struggle with ADD, you know, my attention span doesn't last all that long. But I find, and I've noticed this with other people who struggle with ADD, ADHD, is to read, to find those resources to read, to watch. Um, And so I love reading. That's one of my, I consider it one of my hobbies. And so like books that have really affected me as a theologian, there's Grace Upon Grace by a man by the name of John Kleinig. He is a professor out of Australia. Uh, Great guy. I got to meet him one time. One of the kindest men I've ever met. Um, another one that I that really actually kind of saved my life was "Dying to Live: The Power of Forgiveness" by uh, Harold Sinkbile. Um, you know, it's that struggle of wanting forgiveness, and well, it's there for you in Christ. Um, another one, it's a little thicker, but it's still a good read. Uh, "The Fire and the Staff" by Clement Price, um, very easy read. Um, <laughs> His anecdotes, his illustrations, his talking from experience really goes a long way in trying to help us realize what being a Lutheran is really all about, or not just a Lutheran, but a Christian. A book about what the church is and should be doing in the world today. Exactly. There you go. That's good stuff. So, well, thanks for joining us. And and to anybody watching this, that, that would be the advice, not because of these three guys, but because of our Lord, uh, be in the word you know that's that's the thing that's going to shape us change us save us and direct us and and wherever the word is the holy spirit is and um and we're going to hear more about that on sunday you know pentecost what a blessing that is so uh so be in the word 
Not that you can't be in the other things, but be in the word more than the other things. So everything is shaped by the word. So thanks for being here and let's uh, go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you that we live in a time where your word is readily available to us. Help us to never take that for granted. Help us to read Mark and inwardly digest that uh, as, as we say, so that it can be the thing that shapes us. Help us in all things to follow your design for our lives. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Take care and God bless.